Hey, welcome into the live stream today. We're going to be jumping into the CPI, the Inflation Reduction Act, how Gareth Soloway thinks all of this will affect Bitcoin and Ethereum. We'll drill down into all that. My name is Paul Barron. Welcome back in to TechPath. Joining me today, of course, is Mr. Gareth Soloway, otherwise known as G Money. <laughs> I love it. <laughs> how you doing, Paul? I'm doing good, man. It's good to have you back on the show in our Mondays and uh, kind of macro and markets uh, breakdown. A lot happening in the space. Obviously, we have a CPI print coming up this Friday, but no FOMC meeting this month. Uh, so the Fed's going to have a couple of these before they um, come back together and convene their next meeting. But we did get some uh, big news. And then, of course, that is the Inflation Reduction Act. So lots happening out there for sure. So, Gareth, I want to jump to this first story. CNBC, market's biggest winners and losers in the Inflation Reduction Act. The big ones have been most of, mostly geared toward big business, obviously solar, and now electric vehicles in the automotive industry kind of up in the, um, up in the air because we're seeing a little bit of movement in that. My question to you is when you look at what this act says it's going to do, and I was looking at some of the, just some of the things. Changes are going to be more gradual than many headlines uh, imply. The other thing they wanted to break down to, I thought was interesting right here. Uh, analytics say uh, this will be raised over 10 years by imposing, this is going to be the 15% minimum tax on corporate profits for businesses that earn a billion a year. So this could affect the S&P. Uh, and then this happens by applying the 15% uh, rate to the book rate profits companies disclose to Wall Street. So again, back to the potential of affecting the S&P 500, which push, could potentially affect crypto markets in general. What is, your, what is your overall take on this right now, how the markets might respond? Yeah, I mean, I, I think as of now, the markets are kind of taking it with a grain of salt. They don't seem to be too positive or too negative on it. I think, I think they're taking it the right way, which is that you know, it is more spending, but at the same time, it's probably not that much compared to multiple rate hikes, like a 75 basis point rate hike by the Fed probably, you know, basically negates that if you ask me. Yeah. Um, so I think the markets are kind of in that position of saying, okay, you know, it, it's good for certain stocks, alternate energy, solar stocks, stuff like that. But for the most part, they're all focused on that data at this point, right? We have that two months, like you said, before the next Fed meeting. It's all about the CPI number this week. And I think the markets probably are going to chop uh, going into that. All right, so markets uh, correcting a bit. You've got all this news out from projects like or companies like Tesla, along with Ford, GM. All those really don't get the benefit. I was looking at this Reddit uh, theme right here on the unofficial 2023 uh, clean vehicle tax. I know some of you guys may not necessarily think, how does this apply to crypto or how will this apply to markets? What I look at is the automotive industry as being a big catalyst. And obviously electric is one of the things that creates a lot of activity. Obviously, we got Tesla doing a stock split, split this month, plus other aspects of all these new car makers that are really advancing their development on electric vehicles, which if this gets hit, again, starts to hit the car makers on the S&P 500, which most of which are on the S&P 500, including mm -hmm. uh, Tesla, of course. So I think that's a, a bigger look. Okay, so Real Vision puts out a tweet and says, all right, U.S. stocks, futures, crypto, both meaningfully up today. Uh, Bitcoin and Ethereum poking the heads at 24 and 18. Let's just jump into Bitcoin first. And I want to get your chart on where you think Bitcoin is rolling at the current. The last time we were together, uh, you were picking around a 25.5 mark to 28. And what is your feeling right now? Are we near that or do you feel like we've kind of started to, to peak at this rally? No, I'm still in that same camp. I mean, in the very minimum, I think 25.5, I still have about an 80% probability that we'll get to that level. And if we just take a look at the chart, you can see we've just been meandering in this beautiful kind of consolidation yep. phase, right? So so it's been, it is a bearish channel. I mean, let's be clear on that, but that doesn't mean we can't go up a little bit. And if you look now, the high end of the channel is crossing right at that pink trend line, which is actually that 25.5 pivot low from the Terra Luna collapse. So it makes right. a lot of sense to me that we should see one more push up right into that level. And then the question is, can it break that? And that's going to be the tougher scenario for, for Bitcoin to get through that 25.5. And then if we, again, and I think we'll look at Ethereum in a little bit, but Ethereum, like you said, is bouncing around this level of resistance. 
Um, but I do think there's a chance that you could get up to that next one right around 2000 if Bitcoin can make that next move up. So I think for the most part, um, I'm still neutral to positive. I think that you have a Fed that's on, on hold. You're likely going to see a reduction in in or inflation numbers are going to come down. We've, we've seen commodities really come down substantially over the last couple of months. That has to you have to think that's going to filter through to the CPI data this week. And I think that gives the market that ability to have a little bit more risk on before we see maybe some downside in the next few months. All right. So let's go to CPI, because to your point right there is there's some people that are looking at has the market uh, peaked. This is a good uh, breakdown of it. Obviously, they uh, predicted us 8.7 uh, year over year uh, compared to what we saw last month uh, in June at 9.1. Uh, core inflation rate, which excludes obviously food and energy prices, uh, is seen increase in 6.1 from a year ago, up from 5.9. So again, both of these hit. Now, some people are still kind of uh, looming that July's number could be stronger than June's number. If that is the case, if we do print an additional CPI, more, more pricing uh, fears, and, and I think just in general when you look at inflation, as a whole, because this obviously is going to be leading into the uh, July numbers or the August numbers for September uh, coming up next. So we'll have two CPI prints. If we were to get a, a an up leg again in CPI, what would that do to Bitcoin come this Friday and Saturday? I, I think it would create a big sell off. I think you get a risk off trade in both the equity markets as well as the crypto markets. And again, the idea is we already we already got a stronger than expected jobs number. If you couple that with higher inflation again, the markets are going to say, oh, my goodness, the Fed has to do 75 basis points in September. And who knows if they can even stop going into the midterm elections at that rate. Right. So I would be very surprised if that happened. But if it did happen, you're looking at a big sell-off, especially because the equity markets and even Bitcoin have rallied over the last couple months, especially since the last Fed meeting when the Fed was much more dovish, right? Right. So that alone kind of is building in the fact the markets have been building in this idea that those CPI numbers are coming down. If that doesn't happen, watch out below. So here was uh, some interesting points right here. Producer price index. This was July. Uh, consensus estimate right around 10.4 increase again from a year ago down from the June 11.3 increase. So it might be back to your point is that we've already started to see uh, energy and oil prices started to adjust downward. If this is, is truly the case and we do see this uh, moving down, here's my question because this is something that we've talked about here on the show for quite some time is CPI is usually the leading indicator. Uh, the lagging indicators, real estate, job numbers, obviously yeah, yeah. credit, you know, consumer credit, et cetera. Let's paint it out a different way now. And we get CPI coming down from that 9.1. Let's say we're back in the eights, maybe a low eight that comes in on this Friday. What happens to crypto markets at that point? Do you feel like we continue to rally? Yeah, I think that might be the catalyst to push us to that 25.5 level. So I wouldn't be surprised if the initial reaction is people's kind of breathing a sigh of relief saying, okay, we're past this nasty storm. I mean, granted, it's still inflation, right? So you're, it's not like inflation is negative or down to zero, but at least we're not seeing higher numbers. And, and I agree with you, the lagging indicator of jobs. I mean, I can't, I mean, I'm sure you've talked about this, but like every day I, I see a new big mega company reporting new layoffs. And so yeah. even though we had a strong jobs number, at some point, all these companies laying off people, it's going to filter through. My guess is the next jobs number, we start to see that. And that's one more signal that the Fed probably has to take a, a slowing approach to raising rates. Yeah, and, and that is the, the scenario we've been painting out for quite some time is Q3, Q4, the jobs numbers will catch up. Also, the other aspect of that is how long would we see before we start to see true credit crunch on American okay. consumers, which obviously will happen once that they have savings and or, you know, ex, you know, disposable income exhausted, they'll start to moving, moving to credit, which is a concern because some people look at that credit number as being a very, uh, a very big issue if we lead into obviously a continued recession. Okay. Yeah. So 
we've played the positive. Go ahead. You were going to mention something. Oh, I was just going to say, and I, and I think, and I did see this stat recently about how many car loans are being, fa- you know, falling right. behind on their payments. And I think you're starting yep. to see that. And what's so scary about this scenario is that it's not only a slowing economy, but we obviously, the car loan aspect, what that tells us is that it's not necessarily the slowing economy yet that's impacting, it's inflation. So you throw a slowing economy, like people losing jobs with inflation, and the yeah. idea is that, I mean, you're going to see a lot of defaults out there. Yeah, and I think they even hit it on this article right here. Even though inflation might have peaked, consumers have stretched their balance sheets extensively. So it gets back to my point of being yeah. potential risky on the credit side of this. So let's, all right, so we've painted one photo, uh, one picture here. If we don't get uh, a decreasing CPI, we see a, a dour trend coming in, at least you know for a short period of time. Uh, till we see the Fed come in and make a decision on how they're going to hand handle and manage this back end here. But if we get a positive uh, signal, meaning a downward trend on CPI, what happens if the CPI goes up and at the same time we still have some bullish indicators in the market? Do you feel that there's any potential that the market continues to respond upwards or do you feel like that still is the trigger that is a downward trend? Yeah, I mean, I still have to think that, you know, inflation not coming down would be a very, very nasty wound to the market because it just okay. it just tells you that, again, the Fed has made it very clear that they have to get inflation under control and they're willing to push the economy into a recession. So the market's hoping that inflation starts coming down and that eases the Fed's pressure to kind of continue to lift rates. If that doesn't happen, I mean, you have to think the Fed is more than willing to push us into a steep recession to get that, and the market would not like that one bit. Yeah. Cost controls, one of the things that has been looked at in the market is obviously um, transportation. And you've got a a scenario kind of painting out right now. Last 10 years, average price of a new car up 56%. According to CPI, official inflation measure, this being up only 19% from the last 10 years. So it's not really a good indicator here. Do you think the real number here is the question? Because there's still price pressures coming in, even if we get a downward print, but we still have these real numbers, job is still questioned, the job market is tight, uh, according to Powell. Uh, We still get this pressure on companies laying off and those kind of things. With that being the case, when would you look at the opportunity for Bitcoin, because you and I have talked about this, is that once we do see that 25 to 28, the likelihood is the next stop could be a downward trend. And those Mm -hmm. could lean into that area that we're talking about, which is Q3, Q4, of potentially being the real bottom uh, where crypto could go. Do you feel like that is the fall? right now that that's that's still what i'm looking at right is that is that you have this period where the the idea is maybe the fed can generate a soft landing and that's giving these asset prices we're seeing the stock market having quite a monster rally off of its recent lows bitcoin hasn't had a monster move but if you've looked at ethereum ethereum's had a huge move off of the lows as well so i mean you know the idea is the soft landing keeps us from going into recession it keeps the fed from really tightening too much more but if you get this scenario and and this is what i think is going to happen is i think you're going to see an economy that slips into a recession then a worse recession and the fed again the inability initially to save the markets is, is by printing money like they have in past recessions is going to be very, very problematic. And it's likely going to trigger a domino effect into a worse recession. Now, at some point during this worse recession, probably in 2023, you're going to see the Fed say, oh, my goodness, unemployment is now at 10 percent. You know, with a recession, you usually see a reduction in inflation. Maybe inflation's come back to 4%. And they're going to say 10% unemployment, we have to start printing again, or at least lowering interest rates to stimulate growth and get some of these right. people off of unemployment. And that's going to be, to me, that is where where you see the pivot in Bitcoin from a risk on or, or risk on asset to actually becoming more like that gold and starting to take off in those printing money periods. Yeah. A lot happening between now and then when you yeah. look at, yeah, and just in general, I think many people are kind of really kind of looking at the overall global uh, macro scenario, whether you look at Taiwan, what potentially is going on there, obviously with uh, Russia and Ukraine and how all of this, even though I feel like Russia and Ukraine have started to slip into the subline, the subtext of what's happening globally, 
And the more interesting aspect right now is this whole scenario with uh, Germany, obviously with now we are nearing their most peak period of time in which they start to need uh, gas. Yeah. And obviously, you know, Nord Stream is going to start to control that, obviously with Russia. So this will be uh, this will be a very interesting winter. Uh, I heard and read recently that the Germans were actually stockpiling fuel now. So mm-hmm. if that if they're looking at that, I mean, obviously we could not have any kind of debacle in Germany because that would in fact effect have a trickle effect through the entire EU, which obviously would would again affect more of a global aspect. Of that you look at Charlie uh, Bailio, he talks a little about the Treasury uh, yield. It's moved up to three point two nine percent. It's the highest level since December. This is 14 months ago. That was just 14 months ago. And it's now we're we're talking about it hit all-time low of 0.04%. You kind of see it there. Where would the, does this have any bearing, in your opinion, on what's happening in the treasury yields uh, for where Bitcoin and just in general crypto could be going? Do you have a, a chart comparison? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I can look at the 10 year here, and I think the 10 year is, is really interesting to to take note of. Let me bring that up for you guys. And to take a look. So here's your tenure. And what we have seen is that the tenure has backed off. And what I like to tell people is that the tenure yield is is very much a forecaster, right? So initially the Fed was going to have to be so aggressive with all these 75 basis point hikes. So prior to those hikes, you really saw the tenure yield surging to the upside. Now, interestingly enough, let me show you this here chart. Let's go but to a different tenure yield chart here that I have. But basically if we look at that, and I'm not getting the right one up, but bottom line is there's a key. There was a key trend line hit right here, where if we stretch this out, you can see that this trend line, the yields when we got to about 3.5 percent, tagged that line, and you can see what's happened. I mean, it was it was you couldn't have nailed the better top in the yield, but notice what's happened since then. We've now seen the Fed kind of being a little bit more dovish, even in spite of the hot, the, the hot jobs number. And I think, again, yields are likely starting to think about maybe the chance of a recession. And we all should remember that the bond market is known as the smartest of the markets. That big money from the bond market usually is a better forecaster than short-term stock market moves. So I think that, again, I wouldn't be surprised, and I have it forecast that we could see um, in the next six months a move down on the 10-year yield to basically close to 2% before it starts to stabilize and maybe turn back up. And the only way that's going to happen is if we slip into a steep recession where people start speculating that we now maybe will see the Fed loosen up on policy and maybe not be so aggressive. Yeah, to your point, uh, this article kind of pins on that, and that is Bitcoin may behave more like a U.S. Treasury bond in comparison. So if you look at that, especially Treasury bonds and gold during these market recoveries, Uh, scenarios. Do you see Bitcoin kind of in these tighter markets responding a little bit more like treasury? So I I think that for the most part, you know, that's a tricky question. Um, I'm kind of leaning towards the concept that Bitcoin still is that risk on risk off asset at this point. But I Mm -hmm. do think eventually you see that neck that that pivot point where you get Bitcoin to kind of be more of a dramatic mover to the upside during periods of turmoil. And again, I think that is coupled with the Fed starting to print again at some point in the in the distant future. Uh, in terms of trading with the, the 10-year, it's, it's, right now it's not. It, it could mm-hmm. change, obviously. But right now, I'm not seeing that. Yeah. Interesting stuff. I think that'll be, you know, and again, a lot of these macros that we're looking at here on the show and we talked to a ton of people right now. We've, we've kind of had two different schools of thought. We'll have, um, let's see, we've had two negative schools of thought, thinking a little bit in line with you is that we're going to see a bearish run here and most likely after a little bit of a rally, uh, possibly that 28 number is the number that could cause that. Well, timing-wise could be the big factor there. But if you look at the last two uh, macro analysts that we've had on, we're getting ready to have on uh, Mr. Yusko, Mark Yusko, who I think is in the opposite position. His theory is that the printing is going to begin again, that the, the Fed has backed themselves into a position that they basically cannot deal from. You know, they obviously are, are going to be in a situation that this potentially could be an alternative. If Yusko is right, of uh, his theory being that we are past it and we are now on the upside of recovery, um, First of all, do you think that is the case? 
Yeah, so I actually agree with that. It's just the timing of it, right? So I, I'm in the position of, of looking at it and saying, all right, the Fed, there's no way the Fed will start printing at this stage or even in the next, let's say, six months because they can't do it with inflation numbers as high as they are. But yeah. once inflation yeah. numbers do come down to a, an elevated level but not extreme level, again, 4%, which is kind of where I see them coming back to, and then you do get the economy to swing into a recession that's bad enough, I, I absolutely agree that the Fed will start printing again. It's their only playbook that they have left yeah. to do to stimulate and the markets expect it. Investors, I mean, what's amazing about the price action recently, just yesterday, or I should say Friday and today, we saw the meme stocks running again like crazy, oh, yeah. like it was 2021, which tells you that small retail money is thinking that just like in, in the, the, the COVID crisis, the Fed is going to come out, print, and get us all back to all-time highs in a matter of months. I think that's that's a fake out. I think the Fed, again, there's no way the Fed can print with the pressure it's putting on. And just think about politically, like you have a, a midterm election, the Fed can't start printing before that. I mean, that would be catastrophic no for the Democrats. So again, I agree that the printing will start again. It's just probably at some point in the next year to year and a half versus in the near term. Yeah. What are your thoughts on the BlackRock, uh, BlackRock Coinbase deal? Because this obviously deal could trigger Bitcoin to burst to this guy, you know, <laughs> saying Bitcoin yeah. could literally just take off to the moon. Do you think this is a yeah, good it's... position for just crypto in general with the fact that we now have BlackRock, which is ironic, uh, and their position with, uh, with Coinbase? What are your thoughts on that? Yeah, so I, I actually like it. I mean, it's it's one step. I don't think it changes the fact that we're in a bear market. Greed and fear really rule the markets. And right now, people are fearful if the economy tanks more, if it's risk off, people will sell regardless. And, and probably institutions will still be very hesitant to, to buy into Bitcoin until we have a firm framework of, of um, kind of regulation out there from the government. But I do think, again, like I love seeing this stuff since I'm a long-term Bitcoin bull because it's just kind of one more piece of the puzzle that's going into, into kind of the frame that will be a positive long-term for crypto. It's the adoption, right? I mean, for me yeah. as in a Bitcoin long-term bull, my biggest fear is that it becomes obsolete, that institutions never get involved, that you don't have that money, that people put pension funds in it and all these things. And BlackRock getting involved with Coinbase to me kind of is just a great thing in the long term. It doesn't affect short term price. Long term, it's really good. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about Bitcoin versus Ethereum in terms of the asset class to hold. If you are in a position right now, maybe you can hold both. You're a little bit more risk adverse or maybe you are a, an investor that says, hey, I really want to look at a better gain position uh, for the, you know, one of the blue chips. So if you're looking at Bitcoin and Ethereum, which one do you like right now leading into what we're dealing with, at least in the short term? And which one do you like long term? Good question. Uh, so short term, I'm going to play the conservative side, and I think Bitcoin is the play here. Ethereum's already over 100% off of its lows. And I think, again, Ethereum has that higher beta where in, in market bounces, it's going to do more, but then in market bear markets, it's going to lose a lot more as well. And because I still think we have that leg down, I think if you had to choose one, you want Bitcoin because, again, it has the it has relative stability to Ethereum. Now, longer term, that's the better question, right? Um, I think that, again, you'd probably want some exposure in both. So you cover both bases. You have the use case of Ethereum and the Ethereum network, and then kind of the digital gold where a lot of, a lot of institutional money will flow into the Bitcoin you know, Bitcoin investments. So, so I think you, yeah. in longer term, I like both of them. I think I would, I would generally say to people to be careful with other cryptocurrencies because you know, we, we see, if you look back two years ago, a lot of the ones that were in the top 20 are no longer in the top 20 um, of market cap. So there are ones that are replacing, like Solana wasn't around that long ago. Avalanche yeah. wasn't around that long ago. And so there's still a jockeying for what the next, the third and the fourth and the fifth will be, um, as if you're looking at the blue chips. So I think you, if you're looking out long term, you don't know yet, but I would stick with Ethereum and Bitcoin as your investments for the longer term right now. Well, and you've also obviously at the merge potentially going to come yep. in September, even though I'm still skeptical as to whether or not that's going to happen. I mean, it will happen, I believe, but it's just timing again will be a big factor, even though I think September would be an absolute amazing time for Ethereum to do that, because I think it would have some, you know, some significance around midterms going into midterms. 
and the potential of just the ecosystem. But to your point, there are going to be some very interesting uh, question marks, I think, especially on the altcoins because of the pressure we're seeing from the SEC. Yes. Obviously claiming some of these, if not most, are um, securities and now putting kind of a, a, you know, pinning a tail on a donkey of saying these are the ones that we're going to hit and, uh, you know, going after Coinbase in this scenario. So lots happening uh, around that. If okay, so you're still. It sounds to me like you're getting becoming a little bit of a Bitcoin uh, Ethereum maxi over there, Gareth. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely with Bitcoin, and I would say, I would say that. I mean, longer term, yes. You know, and one of the things to remember is even when I was bearish at sixty eight thousand or so, it, it's not that I don't love the concept. Going back to when I first learned about Bitcoin in two thousand and twelve, you know, it was when the Fed was printing just after the 09 crisis, and it just makes so much sense to have a currency or some sort of store of value that's not US dollars, not euros, not yen, all these crisp, uh, currencies that can be printed at nauseum by, by central banks. And so I love the concept. It's just the growing pains as a trader, you start to recognize these charts. And it, and you know it doesn't make sense to hold at 69,000 or 68,000 when you see it going to 20 or sub 20. Might as well yeah. sell there and re-enter at a much better entry. Then you buy a lot more and then you get ready for the next run. Yeah, and that brings up a good, I think a good question, because again, remember guys, we do these market movers with guys like Gareth. We do a ton of analysis, macro analytics. We jump into charts. We give you some of our own power index data, but not investment advice. My point though, Gareth, on this is when you look at strategies, because to you, the point you just made is knowing exits and entries. That's really what trading is. Even if you're doing long-term trading, which is over you know, the course of a year, you're in and out of the market maybe two or three times. You're not a day trader, you know, you're a spot trader. And with those kind of entry points, you do get an opportunity. I do it all the time with some of the, the altcoins that I love, Avalanche, even to a certain extent. I did some spot trades on Cardano and Solana this, this month and have, have turned out great. But when you look at this on a long-term basis, do you feel that is a sustainable uh, strategy for investors, or do you feel like, hey, no, you just got to look for those opportunities on dollar cost averaging and continue to ride the wave out? It certainly is very tricky for kind of a retail investor because, you know, again, picking tops and bottoms is extremely hard. It's taken me, I mean, I've been a trader for two decades now, and, and it certainly didn't come to me in the first decade. Um, it came to me more in the second one. Now, having said that, I do think that the retail crowd can start to at least look for certain signs that make them feel uncomfortable. And just like you dollar cost average in, there's nothing wrong with dollar cost averaging out in a way where you take a little bit off the table. And what I would say to retail, the retail crowd is, you know, look for signs of mass hysteria. And when you see that, when you see everyone, when you go into the bagel store, or the pizza place, and you got the guy behind the counter telling you he just got into Dogecoin or he just got in, you know, those are signals that as a trader, you can't get excited by, you actually need to get fearful by. And yeah. so again, I'm not saying you necessarily want to say, oh, I'm going to dump my whole position, but what's wrong with taking 25% off when you see those mm -hmm. signs and then potentially rebuying at a lower level? So I think dollar cost averaging in is great. And I also think taking a little bit off the table, like I say to all the traders that I trade with, no one went broke taking a profit, right? Worst case, yeah. you might not have made as much, but at least you locked some in. Yeah, that's the key. Lock in profits. Don't forget, guys, drop a few questions in. We'll try to get some of those here on the sidebar. Last chart for you, uh, Gareth, is Ethereum. Uh, obviously, we've seen it run to 1800 today. The potential for Ethereum to continue its move up, what is your analysis on that one? Do you like this as a position to take some profits if somebody is in a trade, let's say, in, you know, because we've had a chance to get in it, Ethereum, all the way down to a thousand bucks. And there's been a lot of buy ins, yeah. at least I know in our group, at around 12, 13, and 1400. Is now a time to grab that profit while it's here? So I would say that this is a time to take a little bit off the table, right? So what you can see is, again, you got down, even though down here, it was as low as about just below 900. So you have to look at it. And, and one of the things as a trader, I, I, I make sure to mark myself. It's not what your entry is. It's what the low was. So, you know, your right. entry might have been 1400, but if it went to 900 or 885, it's now up 100% off of those lows. And you have to say right. that's a big run in a very short amount of time. Now, having said that, 
I love the fact that the chart is banging on this resistance. You can see the resistance very easily over here. I love that we hit it here. We consolidated. We hit it here again. And then it looks like we're trying to break out. So taking a little off is a good idea. To me, it still looks like there's a little bit more upside in Ethereum, likely coinciding if we can get to 25.5 or, or greater on Bitcoin. One of the levels to watch would be 1900. You can see this kind of area right here. And then really, I would even say the even number of 2000 would be your next level. So, you know, let's just say you have a full position on Ethereum. I think you look to take maybe 20% off here, 20% off above 1900, 20% off above 2000 and just kind of cycle out that way and then maybe yeah. just hold your your remaining 20 or 40 percent and just say i'm going to roll with it just in case we start a new bull market and then you participate but we certainly in all fairness i'm i'm believing that we're going to start coming into some big resistance and eventually uh roll over the last thing i would just note is this would be kind of the most bullish case scenario where i would actually short ethereum if ethereum got a monster move up into this trend line I would probably pull this trigger on a short in the next couple yeah, of weeks. For sure, for sure. All right, very cool stuff. Let's get into some questions, Gareth. There's a few here, I think, for you. Jim Ward comes in, uh, wants to jump in on the first question, and that is, uh, if Bitcoin go, does go down to the 10 to 12 range, we've both been talking about that, uh, will ETH also follow it into, say, the three to $400 range, or do you feel that's like just too deep of a cut for Ethereum? No, I actually, I actually think that's reasonable. In fact, um, I, I do have a trend line down. There's a level that it was consoled. But before we started the big run in 2021, in late 2020, in, in, in December of 2020, there was a bunch of choppy consolidation around 645. That's kind of what I'm looking at. So again, I'm not sure if we're going to see 300 or 200 or those numbers. But for me, that's where I would start to accumulate on a, on a big drop in Bitcoin. And that kind of makes sense, right? Because if you yeah. think about it, it would take it would be about a fifty percent haircut on to get us down in that general ten to twelve range, and then you think Ethereum would probably do a sixty six percent or so, and that would be right around that six hundred dollar level. So for me, I'd start accumulating around six hundred. And remember, you never want to just say, "Oh, I'm only going to buy everything at this level," because you never know if it will hit. So put your put a small amount out here and a little bit lower and a little bit lower, and do that same dollar cost averaging on entries. Yeah, I think this is, uh, and, and you know, from a strategy standpoint, there's two things you have to look at. Um, and one is the macro side of things, and then you have to look at the overall market from a black swan side of things with what's yes. happening. We'll get to that in a second, because I want to mention something to you. I do, do, do want to jump to our poll, because uh, I know we've got one coming up here. All right, so inflation act going to cause a week long pump until bill is signed. 63% says we are going to see some pumps this week. Interesting. Hmm. Yeah. Well, quite a few. With that being the case, a lot of people like this in the sense that, yeah, it's just giving out more free money. Mm -hmm. <laughs> puts money into the into the markets, puts money into the affluence hands, possibly, or at least gets them in a position where they're going to trade a little bit, a little bit looser. Uh, but at the same time, you've got things happening on the other side. You've got Holdenot going down, which was another exchange. And then you have Wazirex, which was the largest Indian exchange. I mean, essentially, that's the Coinbase for India, now tagged with a raid over the weekend and obviously uh, a scenario of claims against money laundering. So, again, more and more exchange pressure, more and more uh, black swan pressure. If we see kind of a double dip here, more problems in the economy from a global and macro standpoint, and a continued problem with liquidity on whether it's an exchange or other entities within the crypto space, do you feel that it is still bottom, uh, the potential bottom for Bitcoin still in that uh, 10 to 12 range? Mm, that's, I mean, that is the million dollar, billion dollar question. So, so I would say this is that, you know, you have two ways of looking at it. One is the pure technicals, which is the 10 to 12,000 range that we've been talking about. And right. then you have the, what if this is an absolute wipeout where you do see these exchanges go belly up and you do see 90% yeah. of cryptos go to zero, in which case you have to refer back to the Amazon chart at .com, the dot-com era, which went down 95%. So if, if that worst case occurs, you're talking about a $3,500 handle on Bitcoin. Now, again, at that point, everyone's like, oh, I'd buy as much as I can. But remember, you'll probably be so scared at that point that you're going to yeah. be like, I don't know if I want yeah. to. So, so just be aware trigger. of the emotional. <laughs> What's that? Don't pull the trigger. 
Yeah, you'll I be know. In the, you'll be I, in that. It, it's, it's always and, and I think I think the important thing to remember is that, you know, first of all, fear is usually what you want to buy. Now it's hard to, to remind yourself of that when you're fearful. But mm-hmm. remember, doing a small amount, there's nothing wrong with that. At that price, you buy $10,000 worth. And that's the, I mean, think about what you could get with 10,000 today in terms of Bitcoin, not even half a Bitcoin, but you could right. get over three Bitcoin or about three Bitcoin at that point. So you can always do it small. And then if we if it is a long term bottom and we go to a hundred thousand, you're making a ton of money anyways. But you always want to do like a level where where if it is a debacle, you don't get hurt too much. Gareth, you don't I know you don't trade in a ton of altcoins, but when you look at what's happening with Ethereum, the potential of this merge, obviously the ecosystem around it. We had Chainlink not deciding to go the route uh, with the merge itself. Then you have Cardano. Avalanche, Solana, all their ones that potentially could benefit if if Ethereum stumbles a little bit here. What about Cardano on this? Because we have a ton of Cardano lovers and there might be a trade here. Is there one? Have you looked at Cardano in the short time? Yeah, yeah. In fact, I actually like the chart on Cardano. So if we take a look at the chart here, what you can see is that you you basically held held this low going back to May. It tried to retest, but never really touched it, which is a positive. And now you're consolidating and you keep on hammering on this resistance line. Now, the more you hammer on resistance, the weaker resistance becomes and the more likely that you break out. And if you get a breakout, you have really no major resistance until about 64 to 65 cents on Cardano. So so actually Cardano is looking very, very attractive here, in my opinion, in the near term. Yeah, I think it's going to be one to watch for sure. Lots of questions over here. Uh, XRP, waiting for clarity. Yes, I think we're going to see a lot happening there. Uh, for Gareth, when does when do you think the SPY uh, will hit the pre-COVID highs around 340? Do you think we'll see a, a pre-COVID high on the SPY? I do. I do. And I think it's going to happen sooner than we all think. I mean, after this bounce, it seems like it's far, far away as it's, I think that's around, if I'm looking at the chart here, around 340 on the SPY and we're at 413 right right now. But I actually think that once this market gets selling, we could be there by year end, in fact, if not, you know, January of 2023. So, so be careful once we get, I think we're in this quiet zone of August right now where we're waiting for the next Fed meeting. Yeah, we'll get some CPI numbers, but people are on vacation with the kids before school starts. That's normal for markets. Once we get through into September, I think this downside resumes. And then probably by the fourth quarter, you see that low break on the spiders that we put in recently. And then I think by year end or early 2023, we're there. So it's it's going to happen a lot sooner than I think people think. Yeah, this is going to be a very interesting time over the next 90 days because it will Mm -hmm. dictate a a lot of what is happening, obviously, for the end of the year, but more so I think into Q1 for next year, because there's going to be a lot of fireworks, I think there. Obviously with midterms, we'll see a new regulatory environment, both from a lawmaker standpoint, we may start to get some at least directional clarity from what could be an entire new position. And don't forget guys, come early uh, 2024 or 2023, we start seeing the potential candidates for the next presidency start to shake out. Right. which will have a big factor on just the investment community at large. So I think it's going to be a fun and interesting time over the next few months. Gareth, always fun to do uh, Monday yes. Macro with you, uh, breaking down all this. Good to see you again. Thanks again for appreciate you uh, stopping in, of course. Oh, it's my pleasure. Always a great time chatting and talking markets with you, Paul. Take care. Excellent. Take care. All right. So you guys are tuned in over on the podcast right now. Thanks so much for tuning in up there. But really the best place to catch all of these analysis, a lot of our charts that you get a chance to see with Gareth. And when we do our own uh, power index break rankings on sentiment, all that good stuff. Of course, it happens here on the YouTube channel. So make sure and tune in right here. If you guys are not part of the Diamond Circle, um, big announcement this this week is one, of course, is that the Diamond Circle members, all you guys get that free of charge. It's, it's easy. You jump in. It's a couple of emails a week that gives you notifications. We do have a program that is tied in with our CPI now. So you can get the power index pretty easy. But if you become a Mastermind uh, member now, starting September 1st, once Mastermind begins, and anybody that signs up prior to that, you're going to get CPI uh, for free. So you're going to get our power index and the Mastermind uh, group, which is our private Slack channel. We're going to start bringing in more uh, or our first new webinars along with other content over on on the Mastermind group. So check it out. It starts with the diamond circle. Just click that link below. You'll be able to join pretty easy. 
you guys want to reach me, it is out on Twitter at Paul Barron. We'll catch you next time right here on Tech Bath.